My name is Lisa Downing and I'm the Assistant uh, Director here at the Forbes Library and it's my pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Tonight is the kickoff event for the All Hamptons Read community-wide uh, reading of The Maltese Falcon by Dashiell Hammond, as Peter just said. Um, it's also part of our ongoing Local History, Local Novelist series. Uh, this series is very unique in that it connects local writers and their work with the culture and history of the community. So we're often, often bringing fiction and nonfiction uh, readers and scholars together to discuss topics. Um, next month we will be um, having an evening centered around the theme of Shays Rebellion. That's Wednesday, April 8th. And uh, as many of you know, uh, it's the Shays Rebellion is um, slightly after the American Revolutionary War. Daniel Shays and others, many of them veterans of the war, attempted to storm and occupy the Springfield Arsenal in 1787. It was a rebellion against heavy fees and taxes imposed to pay the war debt. Uh, we're going to be having Dan Bullen, a poet, Constance Cogden, a playwright, and Richard Colton, a historian at the Springfield Armory, here next month to discuss the rebellion and present work based on this dramatic moment in local history, and we do have flyers for that out, outside. Um, tonight, we are here to explore crime fiction. Uh, crime fiction is an umbrella term uh, for the genre that includes mysteries, thrillers, detective stories, cozies, etc. Uh, these stories are incredi incredibly popular, uh, grossing over 700 million in book sales annually. Uh, librarian Joyce Serix writes, some fans read mysteries because they like to solve the case before the detective. Others enjoy participating in the investigation. All appreciate the ordered universes these writers create, where good and bad are generally readily identifiable and justice triumphs in the end. Seminal in the genre, The Maltese Falcon is a detective novel that is celebrated for its clean prose and sharp dialogue and remembered best probably for the screen adaptation starring Humphrey Bogart. Tonight you'll have the opportunity to learn more about this work and the noir genre as well as to hear two accomplished crime fiction writers read from their work. You'll also get to hear a little surprise nonfiction as well. Um, at the end we'll open it up for uh, Q&A with the audience and um, We'll have, we have books for sale here. Broadside Bookshop is here tonight with some items, so I hope you will visit her. And we'll have refreshments, and Peter will be in the gallery afterwards. We're going to begin with uh, Professor Dean Flower. Dean Flower studied at Oberlin College, the University of Michigan, and Stanford University, where he received a PhD in English and American Literature. He has taught a range of courses in American literature, including a course on film noir in American fiction, 1930 to 1950, and seminars on such subjects as Henry James and William Faulkner. He also teaches occasionally in the Film Studies program, which he helped establish at Smith, including courses in film noir. Professor Flower has written monographs on Henry James and John Updike, edited anthologies of short stories, and published articles and reviews in the New England Quarterly, the Massachusetts Review, Essays and Criticism in the Hudson Review, where he has also served as advisory editor since 1982. His most recent essay, In the Village and Other Stories about Narrative in the Poetry of Elizabeth Bishop, appeared in the autumn 2013 issue of the Hudson Review. We are delighted to have him here tonight to shed light on this dark and mysterious genre. Please welcome Dean Flower. Thank you. Um, I assumed everybody would have a copy of the book in hand, and I, I gather from talking to a couple people that's not the case. Uh, could I ask how many of you are prepared for this class? <laughs> how many? Bravely? <laughs> Not as many as I imagined. Okay, so I may have to make a few adjustments here, but um, is it better if I talk into the microphone? Probably yes, okay. I mean, I like to roam around, but um, I'll stay put. Um, oh, another question for you. I always like to be in questioning my audience. Um, how many of you, whether you've read the novel recently or not, have seen the film of, well, dare I say, just about everybody? <laughs> Point, first point made, right? That this novel is really better known as a film and is a cultural icon. I mean, it's something that we are able to refer to, that people quote from. Um, sometimes uh, unconsciously, it has kind of uh, um, it has a kind of currency in uh, in American uh, writing of, of fiction, and certainly a currency in. Uh, crime narrative in television and film 
Uh, the form, uh, let's see if I can be uh, historical about this. Um, the novel was published in 1930. Uh, installments in um, uh, the Black Mask uh, magazine, a crime uh, pulp, a crime fiction uh, <laughs> magazine that had been around for, for many years um, in 1929. But the book came out early in, uh, in 1930. Um, in 1955, a couple of French critics, uh, Borde and Chomton, uh, Raymond Borde, and I forget Chomton's first name, uh, wrote a book called, uh, in translation, The Panorama of American Film Noir. In other words, they invented the term film noir. Now, we have black in the Black Mask magazine, but there wasn't such a thing as noir fiction until after 1955. That is, people did not use this generic designation until after 1955, when gradually it caught on and people discovered that the works that they had been reading belonged to a genre. Or better still, the films that they had seen belonged to a genre. Because the, the conception of the genre really was created by critics, and French ones at that, commenting on American um, uh, filmmakers. Um, where did these where did this conception come from? Uh, the French critics decided to call this genre film noir because it was black, because its vision was so despairing, negative, cynical, um, and apparently uh, dispiriting. Or as we used to say, existential. I'm not sure what that means. But um, the dates that are usually given for the history of film noir um, and the way it's characterized in their book and came subsequently to be char characterized by American critics uh, and directors um, is roughly 1940 to er the early 1950s. Um, the film of the Maltese Falcon in 1941, directed by, uh, written and directed by, or scripted, that is, by John Huston and directed by John Huston. Um, and another film less well known called I Wake Up Screaming. I love that title. Mm -hmm. uh, but it gives you a fair idea of, of, uh, of what it's like. Um, it seemed that these films shared a profound um, nihilism, a profound sense of, of despair and, as I said before, uh, cynicism. And so the discussion of the films of this era um, that it created out of the uh, sort of synthesizing imagination of these French critics uh, was to a significant extent based not so much on what you might think the, uh, the negativity of the warriors, um, but rather on a great many of the novels that these films were based on. Uh, I'll mention uh, three of the most famous writers of crime fiction uh, of the 1930s, Dashiell Hammett, James M. Cain, and Raymond Chandler. If you look at the dates of the work of these writers, uh, start with, uh, with Dashiell Hammett. Um, he first started writing uh, short stories after uh, a good deal of experience with Pinkertons as a detective, first in Baltimore, then on the West Coast, and even in places like Colorado and Montana. Uh, the only uh, American crime writer who actually had experience as a detective, and he's pretty cynical about um, his fellow writers in the genre who know nothing about guns or know so little about how the laws work. And so, he, uh, but anyway, he, um, he always writes out of, uh, uh, out of experience. Um, I'm sorry, I've lost where I, where I was. The point I'm making is that this vision of film noir that was created by the French critics in which, and, and, and we've adapted, it's always so much better in French. We don't say black, we say noir, and it's some more profound that way. Um, but that conception really, to a great extent, arose out of uh, the spirit, which was indeed black and cynical and despairing, that came much earlier. So when you read, you try to read historically uh, the Maltese Falcon, uh, and just notice the date, it's 10 years before film noir supposedly started. So the noir vision, in other words, really is being generated in a much earlier time. Um, 
if you think of some of the other works that were published uh, around the same time, um, Dashiell Hammett has a great deal in common with Ernest Hemingway. They both have a really a stripped down, um, declarative, um, plain style, so plain that at times it seems rarefied and purified and, and the more powerful for its, uh, for its simplicity. Uh, but I think of the Heming if you're looking for a noir Hemingway, I think of stories like The Killers or The Battler. Or, or think of the, especially the conclusion of uh, A Farewell to Arms, um, a vision of a world in which um, human beings don't really stand a chance that the forces ranged against them are, are merciless. When they catch you off base, they kill you. I mean, it's, it's just a fundamentally, uh, Dashiell Hammond could have written that, uh, uh, that sort of thing. I think as well of, of Faulkner's uh, most unfilmable uh, of all novels, uh, Sanctuary. Uh, the feature element in, that, in this novel, uh, anybody know it? Um, is uh, a rape uh, performed by a corn cob because the villainous pervert who does it is himself impotent. It's, it's one of the bleakest. <laughs> and the date of sanctuary is the same as the Maltese Falcon. I call to mind, if anyone has read Nathaniel West, uh, the noir novel of Nathaniel West that is the bleakest and most uh, despairing is probably not the Hollywood novel, The Day of the Locust, but the earlier one, um, Miss Lonely Hearts. Uh, a man who's got the journalistic assignment of, of uh, handling the Lonely Hearts column and people who write letters to the newspaper looking for uh, relief from their suffering. And what it gives him is a nervous breakdown uh, <laughs> because the suffering is too bleak and there's no answer for it. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very grim, uh, a grim novel, not, not to joke about, of course. Um, I think of some other novels of the 1930s that are equally bleak. Uh, do you see what I'm saying? That this idea, this discovery of noir in films of the 1940s is really something that was being uh, formed in the later 1920s and emerged in a lot of writing in the 1930s. Anybody seen Double Indemnity? That's based on a James M. Keene novel of 1930s. The, the film came later, 42, I think. But um, uh, the novel came out in 1936. Um, do you all remember Fred McMurray, that cozy, gentle you know, father of us all, playing a villainous, sexually aggressive, totally amoral person? But he's partly amoral to begin with, but also the woman he hooks up with is herself um, just as bad, if not worse, than Bridget O'Shaughnessy in Maltese Falcon, but we'll come back to her. Um, Horace McCoy's They Shoot Horses, Don't They? Um, Raymond Chandler's first novel, uh, he wrote a lot of short fiction, which came earlier, but his first novel, uh, The Big Sleep, and when we have The Big Read, I just hear The Big Sleep. <laughs> I think it's, but of course, The Big Sleep is death. Uh, but that, that novel was published in 1939. So I'm trying to suggest, I guess, two things. One is that the spirit of the genre was already formed in American fiction before it was, as it were, translated into film or reconceptualized in, uh, uh, or repeated in a different genre, and then, and then reinvented with, with similar stories and narratives that, um, uh, that grew out of uh, fiction uh, like this. Um, A little bit about the, um, the phenomenon of, of this novel as a film. Um, it was immediately very well received by the critics. It was Dashiell Hammett's third novel. Um, his second one, The Red Harvest, had just been made into a film. Uh, in the same year that the Maltese Falcon was published, uh, uh, Hammett was invited to Hollywood to, uh, to be a script writer. Things didn't work out too well, but uh, he was already looking in that direction or leaning in, in that direction. Uh, and there were two earlier ver film versions of, of the novel, one almost immediately in 1931, 
Uh, both these versions take vast liberties with the novel and don't really recreate it very well. Um, and another in 1936 <coughs> with Betty Davis playing the Bridget O'Shaughnessy character uh, kind of boggles the mind, but uh, somewhat different. Uh, but with a lot of transformations and interpolations. The striking thing is that the people, the public, Hollywood wanted to make this into a successful film. And it wasn't done until John Huston did it uh, in 1940 or 1941 when the film came out. Um, and one of the ways in which he did it, I want to call your attention to uh, particularly. I find one of the most interesting facts about, uh, about the novel, and even a suggestive of a way to read the novel. Um, first of all, what, uh, what Houston did was he followed the, the script of the novel closely. So if you have read, I'm, I'll put it the other way around, having seen the film, when you come to read the novel and you think, well, Gutman is really Sidney Greenstreet, and I hear Sidney Greenstreet's pronunciation, or Bridget O'Shaughnessy is Mary Astor, or Sam Spade is, is Humphrey Bogart. Uh, and that's what we do, isn't it? When in, uh, if we know a, a film well, or, or we know one work, uh, one literary, uh, one genre really well, and then it's translated into the other, we see it, the second version, in terms of, of the first. Uh, but since so many of you are more familiar with, with the, it's not chronological in this case, is it? Because what if you really know the film well, when you read the novel, you're bringing your 1941 experience to, uh, um, to what was actually invented in, um, in 1930 or, uh, or in 1929. Let me find a couple passages here. Houston, as I say, was faithful to the book and followed the book closely. And you will know if you've read it recently or if you pick it up after uh, thinking about it tonight, you will realize how extraordinarily dependent on dialogue this book is. Uh, there are some really interesting passages of description, but that's not the strength of the book. The strength of the book is in the interaction of characters in the authenticity of the language they use, in the feeling of the immediacy of the experience. And my th fundamental point here is that the novel in 1930 was already cinematic, but it's generally not recognized for being cinematic because it doesn't, perhaps at first blush, seem to be cinematic. Uh, let me uh, risk being a little tiresome by talking about um, film technique uh, for a minute. Has anybody uh, encountered uh, the 180 degree rule which Hollywood uh, filmmakers use in, in uh, creating uh, film experience? Um, the 180 degree rule is that when you have two characters talking to one another in a scene, think of the opening scene of the Maltese Falcon, the film, the Maltese Falcon, um, we get some names like on the first, in the first chapter, um, Spade and Archer, and we go in into the office, and we've got two characters. Let's just put uh, Miss Wonderly in the scene, the Bridget O'Shaughnessy character, the Mary Astor character, um, comes in to talk with Spade and Archer, the two uh, uh, detectives. Um, the 180 degree rule says that to keep the spectator oriented, the camera can be placed anywhere, if you draw a line across, so to speak, the stage or the proscenium, the camera can be placed looking straight on. We might look out the window, or we might have an establishing shot of this character on the right, and this one is uh, on the left. And then the camera can move on, uh, along this line, can move so it's looking just at one character who's speaking, and then it or, can move, or another camera can shoot the other character speaking. And this, and the kind of editing that ensues from this, from this 180 degree rule is usually called shot and counter shot. So when we get a dialogue, we get, uh, we get to look, we hear a character speaking, and we see the reactions of one, of, on the face of the character listening. 
or we watch as, as a character speaks something and we watch her expressions and the development of emotion. And the editing, generally fairly unobtrusive, cuts back and forth, shot counter shot between one character and another. Real, real basic film study stuff. If you want to, Bordwell and Thompson's film art discusses this strategy, this basic technique in the first chapter of, uh, of their book. Um, I'm on page 55 of, if you happen to have a copy with you, but just let me read a, a, a tiny little bit. This is a scene between Sam Spade and Bridget O'Shaughnessy. Uh, he stood beside the fireplace and looked at her with eyes that studied, weighed, judged her without pretense that they were not steadying, weighing, judging her. She flushed slightly under the frankness of his scrutiny, but she seemed more sure of herself than before, though, uh, through, though a becoming shyness had not left her eyes. He stood there until it seemed plain that he meant to ignore her invitation to sit beside her, then crossed to the settee. You aren't he asked as he sat down, exactly the sort of person you pretend to be, are you? I call your attention to this simple bit of, oh, could I call it even stage business? Because the point of view is not Sam Spades. He's not telling the story. Certainly not Bridget O'Shaughnessy telling the story. But the story is being told by the expression in Bridget O'Shaughnessy's face, the expression in Sam Spades' face, and we got shot and counter shot. He stood by the fireplace and looked at her with eyes that studied and weighed. So we, we get a sense of what Sam's, what's expressed on Sam Spade's face. Then we get a sense, and she flushes. Then we see her face, shot and, and counter shot. Another, uh, I hope, quick uh, example. Also between uh, Sam and, uh, and Bridget. After um, the fight with uh, uh, Joel Cairo and uh, uh, the police come and there's a great uh, uh, confused scene and, and then they all leave, leaving the two protagonists together. He stared thoughtfully at the girl and asked, what did you do to Cairo? Nothing. Her face became flushed. I tried to frighten him, she goes on. Uh, I had to, he attacked me. Spade says, you don't know what you're doing. Spade's smile did not hide his annoyance. It's just what I told you, you're fumbling along by, uh, uh, by guess and by God. I'm sorry, she said, face and voice soft with, conscious, uh, with contrition. Sure you are. He took his tobacco and said, do you see what, do you see what we have these very short paragraphs and a lot of film criticism is really about the nature of the gaze and who's looking at whom and how the camera gazes at, at characters. And there's a lot of critique, especially feminist critique, about, about the male dominant gaze in cinema. Um, but if you read, as you read, when you reread this film, uh, this novel, sorry, um, think of the way in which, the skillful way in which Dashiell Hammett stages these scenes so that we look we get a speech, we get an expression on a face, and the next moment we turn to the other character, shot and counter shot, and as soon as you start seeing it, uh, it's everywhere. I, have I used up my time? I th yeah, I think I have. But, but I mean, fun to, that's, that's maybe basically the point um, that I'd like you to, to appreciate and, and, and think of the potential for an intimate, a much more intimate kind of connection between genres that we think of as being very different. That film really operates according to visual procedure, purely visual procedures. This is an intensely visual scene, but its dramaturgy is, as I'm repeating myself now, is cinematic. Um, there are a number of other things I'd be real happy to talk about in this novel, but there's not time at, uh, at the moment. Um, but uh, I hope we can continue this um, uh, afterwards for, uh, if possible, more than a brief question and answer uh, session. Okay. Thank you so much. This is it's great. 
Um, our next um, reader is Susan Kelly. Susan Kelly has served as a consultant to the Massachusetts Criminal Justice Training Council and the Cambridge Police Department, and has taught at Harvard, Tufts, and Hampshire College. She is the author of the crime novels Gemini Man, nominated for the Anthony Award for Best First Novel, The Summertime Soldiers, Trail of the Dragon, Until Proven Innocent, and Soon I'll Come to You, and Out of the Darkness. Her nonfiction work, The Boston Stranglers, about one of the most famous criminal cases in US history, came out with a revised edition in 2013. It is with pleasure that I introduce Susan Kelly. Thank you. Uh, shall I use this? Am I loud enough to be heard without it, or am I better with it? <laughs> I'm used, I taught for a long time in this vast amphitheater and you had to scream at the top of your lungs to make yourself heard. So it's a habit that carries over, but anyway. Um, yeah, I write true and fake, so to speak. Um, the book, um, this was the sixth in the series, Out of the Darkness. I suppose if you want to classify it, the nearest thing it comes to is a police procedural. The principal character, Liz Connors, Tallinn has red hair, guess where I got that, um, is a crime writer and the man in her life is a Cambridge police detective lieutenant and they often, their interests in crime writing and crime solving often, very often intersect. The premise of Out of the Darkness is, well, I had wanted to write a, a nonfiction book about some murders that are still unsolved that took place around the Connecticut Valley, you know, on the Vermont border and on the New Hampshire border. As far as I know, they're still unsolved. So I did the research for this and uh, then found out from my agent that somebody else, a, guy, a nice guy named Phil Epstein, had signed a contract with another publisher to do the same book, basically. And they did not think that there would be a market for two books on the exact same subject. So, you know, Phil got there first, so Phil did the book. So what I did was, I, I'm really dedicated to recycling. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I am not going to throw this research away. I'll just turn it into a novel. So that's what I did. And I set it on the Merrimack River, uh, in the Merrimack River Valley, starting in New Hampshire and running down to, you know, where it spills into the Newbury Port, I guess. Um, and what happens in the book is that this very famous true crime writer decides he wants to do a book on these Mary Mac Valley killings. So he looks for a local person to be a sort of co-writer and research assistant, and he picks Liz, which happens to be the name of the character. Uh, and she's thrilled because the magazine that she just worked for, has had worked for, has gone out of business. Uh, his name is Griffin Marcus. So I'll just read a little bit from the second chapter. During the next week, I reread the three Griffin Marcus books I owned and borrowed the four I didn't from the library. They were all terrific, but the one I liked best was Nightcrawler about the Richard Ramirez case. Jack had read five of the books and liked them. His favorite was a collection of interviews Marcus had done with cops nationwide. By way of preparing to meet the man, I found out as much as I could about him. The bio Biomaterial on his book jackets, in addition to saying that he lived in LA, mentioned that he had a wife, a son, and a daughter. He had grown up in Brooklyn and had gone to CCNY, then to the Columbia School of Journalism. He was 48 years old, 10 years my senior. Of his seven books, two had been made into theatrical movies and two into miniseries. There had been plans at one time to produce a weekly television show about him, not hosted by him, not based on one of his books, about him, a series whose hero was an intrepid investigative reporter. The show had never gotten to the pilot stage, though I figured Marcus must have picked up some nice option money for the rights to his life story. All his books had been bestsellers. As the date to meet Marcus approached, I started to get nervous. Jack laughed at me. 
what are you antsy about? He said, you're just as good a writer as he is, just not as famous yet. No wonder I love the guy. Zero hour arrived. I was to join Marcus at six o'clock in the lobby of the Charles Hotel just outside Harvard Square. When I got there, I didn't have any trouble recognizing him. I'd seen too many photographs of the man to make that possible. Anyhow, he was the only person in the lobby other than the concierge and the woman behind the registration desk. I didn't go right up to him. Instead, I stood, out, stood outside the hotel gift shop and looked at him for a few minutes. He didn't notice me. He was watching the main doors. I was surprised at how tall he was. Close to 6'5", it appeared. He had very dark, curly hair and a long, narrow face. He seemed to be on the thin side, but that was difficult to tell given the bulk of the three-quarter length down coat he was wearing. So much for the long distance vantage point. I walked toward him, and as I approached, he happened to turn and see me. I smiled at him, and he smiled back. Surprise, surprise, my knees didn't buckle. Up close, I could see there was a fair sprinkling of gray in his hair. His eyebrows were black, finely drawn, and slanted up slightly at the ends. His eyes were hazel, the cheekbones were sl high, Slavic. Liz Connors, he said. Griffin Marcus, I held out my hand, and he sh took it. Nice to meet you. You're easy to spot. I left. I laughed. Yes, well, wherever I go, I'm usually the only five foot ten inch redhead on the premises. You ought to try Copenhagen. There's a lot of them there. Marcus glanced once more at the hotel entrance. It was starting to sm snow. Small flakes drifted lazily down outside the glass doors. Nice, he said. Reminds me of why I moved to LA. He looked back at me. Well, would you like to get a drink? Love to. Okay. It's a good place. He frowned thoughtfully. I have an idea. What about the Casablanca? I shook my head. Gone. The frown changed to a scowl. What do you mean, gone? It went the way of the wrecking ball about two years ago. He had unusually mobile features. What they re registered now was appalled disbelief. The Casa B? You're kidding. I wish I were. That place was a historical landmark. I know. What's there now? Well, they built a replacement Casa B, but it's just not the same. Marcus let out an exasperated breath. Well, what do you suggest? The bar upstairs here isn't bad. Let's try it. We went up a wide flight of oak stairs to something called the Quiet Bar. It had a lot of couches and easy chairs and looked out on a courtyard. We took a table for four by the window. Marcus slid out of his par parka and dumped it on one of the empty chairs. I threw my coat on top of his. We got settled and a waitress came by to take our drink orders. But Marcus looked at me questioningly. Vodka martini, I said. Rocks. Twist. The same, Marcus said. He dug in his, the pocket of his Harris tweed sport coat and pulled out a pack of Marlboro lights. Mind, he said. Not at all. Go ahead. He lit a cigarette. I can tell this will be a good partnership. How so? He pointed the cigarette at me. A, you drink martinis. B, you're not a health Nazi. <laughs> be warned, I said. Everybody's not nearly as tolerant as I am. There are places here where they'll kill you if you light up. Kill you for your own good. And for God's sake, I don't know if you have any clothing with fur on it, but if you do, don't wear it into Harvard Square unless you want to have somebody throw blood on it and chase you down the street screaming that you're a murderer. Just like California, he said. The waitress brought the drinks. Marcus took a sip of his and leaned back in his chair. Tell me about yourself. All I could think of was Ted Baxter's line about it all starting out in a small 5,000 watt radio station. Not much to tell. I've been writing for about eight years now. And before that, taught college English. Really? You have a doctorate? I nodded. I'm a medievalist by training. No kidding. <clears throat> Marcus set his glass down on the, the round, marble-topped table between us. When that Aprila will assure us Sota, I forget the rest. Yes, most people do the second the exam is over. I didn't do Chaucer any way. I was a specialist in the Arthurian tradition. Why did saying that make me feel like a horse's ass? Marcus said, that must have been interesting. Yes, it was. What I was doing was a sort of combination of history, literature, and archaeology. I had fun writing my dissertation and the scholarly articles afterwards. 
So if it was so much fun, why didn't you stay in it? College teaching, I mean. I made a face. I said the research and writing were fun. I didn't say anything about the teaching. That bad? I shrugged. I thought I'd be lecturing on great works to a bunch of interested, intelligent young men and women. What I ended up doing was teaching grammar to a pack of bored, illiterate morons. It got to the point where I thought if I had to grade one more freshman composition where the kid couldn't write a five-word sentence that didn't have six spelling errors, I'd start screaming at the top of my lungs. Marcus smiled sympathetically. Maybe you just weren't temperamentally suited to the work. Maybe, although I don't know who could be other than a Demerol addict. I like teaching adults, though, real adults. They're polite and they're interested and they do the work and they have something worthwhile to say. I took a deep breath. I hadn't meant to launch into a diatribe. You also taught in a police academy, didn't you, Marcus? I asked. I wondered how he knew and then realized that Brandon Peters, my editor, must have told him. Yes, the one right here in Cambridge. How was that? Fine, I liked it. I taught report writing. I always felt that I had the feeling that what I was doing in the academy was important. And now you're a crime writer. Uh huh. I paused and sipped my drink. That was always what I really wanted to do, write. And now I am. Why crime writing, though? I raised my eyebrows. You ought to know the answer to that. Marcus smiled. I guess he do. I guess I do. He drained his glass. Well, how about getting something to eat? Sure. All right, what's a good restaurant hereabouts? I deliberated a moment. Then I said, what do you know of Mar Cambridge? Marcus shrugged. Harvard, Harvard Square. Then you don't know much. How about a walk on the wild side? The which? East Cambridge, I said. Do I need to bring my Uzi or what? I smiled. Stick with me and you'll be perfectly safe. So that was out of the, well, the second chapter of Out of the Darkness, which then sort of progresses on and into an investigation of this, but they work on together. And there are a number of other complications that develop in the course of the novel, but read it. Let's see if you like it. Um, do I have a little time for this, or am I over time? Or? Oh, OK. All right, this is the real one. F. The Bailey would disagree, but it, you know, it's real. Uh, this is a book that I wrote basically because when I was doing the research for my novels, I got sick of all the law enforcement people asking me who I thought the Boston Strangler was. It was a question that everybody asked me. So let me read just a little bit. Uh, how much do I have? Oh, seven more minutes. Okay. This goes back a way in uh, time. November 8th, 1981 was one of those lead gray days when the sky seems very close to the earth. I was visiting the Cambridge, Massachusetts Police Department to do research for what would become my first published novel, The Gemini Man, a story about a serial killer. I was sitting in the reception area outside the chief's office waiting to speak to a lieutenant a homicide specialist working out of the Criminal Investigation Division. Side by side, on a bench diagonally across the room from me, were two cops, both white-haired, bo both in their late 50s or early 60s, both in plain clothes. They introduced themselves as the two Billies and asked me who I was. I gave my name and added that I was doing research on crime and police work. I did not have the nerve to identify myself as a writer. At that point, my only publications were three brief scholarly articles on medieval literature. The two Billies had been detectives for the past 30 years, the first said. If I wanted some good stories, I should ask them. I smiled and said that I'd look forward to hearing about that. Then I added, at the moment, I'm trying to find out information about serial killers. The two Billies looked at each other. Like Ted Bundy, I said. How about the Boston Strangler, the first Billy said. Him too, I replied. The two glanced at each other again. Their faces wore the slightest of grins. We can tell you a lot about that, the second Billy said. 
Something was going on here. I studied the two men. I'd love to hear it, I said. The first Billy gazed at me, still with that odd little smile. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Who do you think the Boston Strangler was? It seemed like a strange question, sort of like asking who was buried in Grant's tomb. Albert DeSalvo, I said. Everybody knew that. All the newspapers had proclaimed to Salva the Strangler. A best-selling book by a famous writer had said so. Ditto a major movie. History's only most more notorious serial killer was Jack the Ripper. The two laughed. Albert DeSalvo was the Boston Strangler like my dog was the Boston Strangler, the second Billy said. I stared at him. Then I said, tell me. You first, Billy, the second said. I went on to write The Gemini Man, in which I made a passing reference to the two Billy story and five more crime novels. The research for those books required frequent contact with law enforcement officials. Every once in a while, in conversation with one or another of those people, I mentioned what I'd been told that November day in 1981. To my initial surprise and then increasing fascination, almost all the cops, lawyers, and prosecutors concurred with the two Billies. Some had different theories about who the Boston Strangler or Stranglers might have been, but they all agreed on one point. Albert DeSalvo, a construction worker with a long record of convictions for breaking and entering, armed robbery, and sex offenses, was not the killer of the 11 women who died terrible deaths between June 1962 and January 1964. If DeSalvo wasn't, who was? I decided to try to find out. Yeah. Thank you.